Hello everyone, uh, this is Andrea from uh, the Menges. Uh, I'm here on uh, behalf of the whole Punk Rock Aduna crew uh, to get in a conversation with our guest for tonight. This is the first in a series of chats that we're doing here on Instagram Live. Uh, I'm just gonna be on this one, I think, and then uh, I leave the space to other uh, guys of the crew or people of the scene uh, that we will involve in this kind of uh, little happenings. Okay, let me check if I have uh, my... Here he is. Uh, I'm gonna speak to Ben Weezer from... Let's see if the connection works. Ciao, Ben. Hey, hey, how you doing? Good, uh, good. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Uh, really, on behalf of the whole crew of the festival, we are very happy that you accepted to uh, stay with us for for a while tonight. Uh, as you know, these times so, are, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. I just said I'm so happy too. Can't you tell? <laughs> I see you're having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, let's say, how are you? Are you in your house, I guess? Uh, how's your family? And uh... I'm hunkered down in the, uh, in the cabin in an undisclosed location in central Wisconsin, uh, hunkering down away from the coronavirus, as it were. Of course, you Italians know all about that. Here in the United States, it seems like a lot of people, no matter what happens, another day goes by and they say, see, this isn't a big deal. And they don't understand, like, there's an incubation period uh, mm. and uh, that uh, it's very unlikely that we're not going to see major problems. So, you know, I said, well, just get away from humanity for a while. Yeah. It's probably the best thing to do. I heard you say in, uh, in one of your live on Facebook, uh, I think, that you've been training for this uh, your whole life. And uh, oh, it is something that it is something similar to what my drummer said, Manuel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, this whole social distancing thing, I've got that down to a science. Are you kidding me? I've been social distancing since I was five. This is not a big deal to me. Self-isolation? Self-isolation is practically my middle name. And this is, it's funny to see people <laughs> lose their minds about this. It's like, guys, this is day-to-day -day life for me. That's not a big deal. And I like it. <laughs> All right. Uh, we, we get back maybe on the, on the virus thing later. But uh, now I just wanted to say mm, we are happy uh, to have you because uh, also you have a new album out. Yeah. And uh, uh, we basically want you to talk about it. Because uh, in, this, uh, in these uh, past weeks, what I, what I discovered it is that uh, when you talk about the power of uh, music, uh, arts, uh, friends, love, uh, in uh, helping you get into tough times, and I'm starting to see it uh, and understand it in a way that I never... Uh, possibly thought I could. So I think the music and uh, the scene uh, for many of us is keeping uh, at least our minds, uh, you know, focused on something positive. I switch mood uh, every 20 minutes in my, in my day. You know, I go from desperate to positive. But <laughs> <laughs> I see that uh, staying busy on the, on the music and on the friends uh, is keeping me healthy mentally. So yeah, no, I, let's man, talk I, about the record. <laughs> I've been having a panic attack every day right around 1.30, 2 o'clock. It's nice uh, that it kind of gets scheduled into that spot. I can work around it. But, uh, but I know what you mean. I mean, it's a little, you know, for us, we kind of figured um, we were going to put the album out in August. And we were going to go out and, and do a little tour out east, Midwest, maybe go out, out to L.A. and stuff. And, uh, well, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, our our 
manager is a show promoter, I asked him the other day, I said, uh, I said, is this a stupid question? Should we be, you know, now that everybody's canceling their shows, should we be putting holds on dates, you know, with these promoters uh, for like July or August? He's like, no, no way. He says, mm -hmm. everything's shut down. There's not, it's not going to happen. So I don't know if we're even going to get out this year, but I kind of figured let's just move the record up because we're, you know, we don't have any budget. You know, I paid for the for the recording out of pocket. It's on my own label. We've got no money. We weren't going to promote the thing properly anyway. So let's just get out there, mm -hmm. put it out, and give something to people who are quarantined to listen to. Um, and, of course, it's just been, you know, an endless barrage of, why isn't this on vinyl? Why isn't this on CD? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Fuck off is my answer to that. Fuck off. I just gave you free music, you fucking ingrates. I have free music. You just go on Spotify, listen to a couple ads. You go to YouTube. It's fucking free. And you assholes are complaining. It's just unbelievable. I mean, that's, that's humanity for you. But on the <laughs> right side, there are, there are still plenty of good people out there. We're getting lots of nice comments about it. It's a 14-song album. It's called Some Freaks of Atavism. I think it's a pretty darn good record. I'm very happy with uh, the songs and very happy with the performances and the production. I mean, this is one of these things where everybody came together. We spent about three years trying to get this record made and just false starts and, and shattered dreams and, and thwarted hopes. And then suddenly we were able to, to pull it together and make the record. And, and by God, I think it came out pretty good. Yeah, I, I, remember, I remember maybe some years ago you started to record it and then you scrapped it. Yeah. Even, yeah. yeah. And it just wasn't coming together and and uh and you know it was like maybe at demo level and uh and and you know i also realized like i need to do more work on the lyrics um and some of the arrangements still needed work and stuff so uh so that was one of the many problems we ran into but uh but it it's all for the best in the end because it came together really nicely and uh And, you know, if we can get some momentum going here and actually get some streams, you know, we were up to number three on the alternative chart on iTunes yesterday. Oh, yeah, I saw that. We had Billie Eilish, number one and two, and we were three. And it's funny because our guitarist, Trevor, works for Billie Eilish. He's, he's the guitar tech. Uh, so we're all kind of laughing about that. We were nipping at her heels. Uh, so, I mean, we're doing, you know, we're doing pretty good if we can recoup all the money we put into this. I'll gladly turn around and fund the recording of another record, but holy cow, people got to buy the iTunes copy and stream it, stream it until your mm -hmm. ears can't hear it anymore. I, and that's the only way it's going to happen because we're not, we're apparently not going to be playing gigs this year. Yeah, I totally understand your um, position uh, when you say the, in the past that it wasn't worth to make an album if you don't have a, uh the the, the finance uh, the money to finance it and probably not really high expectation about uh, getting the money back or making a profit which is something yeah. that, <laughs> so that that you you, you uh, at least you did in the past uh, uh with the, with the records and uh, many musicians in the punk scene sometimes they they put it aside but uh, i still believe the profits when you make a record are uh, a part Of what uh, uh, of the reason you make it, not because you, you can get rich, but because you can find your band uh, to do other things, uh, and because uh, anyway it is good to be uh, to get a reward for your efforts that sometimes are you know a big part of your life. But still, I believe in the past years uh, that you had very maybe too low expectations. I mean, I, I mean, I see the record is out now. And uh, you're getting a lot of uh, good reviews, good comments from people. And uh, I guess, did you, did you, didn't you think that maybe uh, you've been waiting too much and that, and that anyway, having your music out, new music out is fun, is good well, for, it, for, you, it, for you too. I mean, you, you're enjoying yeah, this? It's a pretty, it, it's a pretty short-lived uh, sense of euphoria. Because, you know, in the internet age... I mean, Always shorter. <laughs> yeah, it's like, boom, it comes and it goes and people forget about it. But, but, yeah, I mean, it's a good feeling. You know, the thing is, though, 
is that largely what you're saying is pretty much a moot point because we didn't have the money, you know, we, and we didn't have anybody offering to give us the money. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, how do you do it? Like, yes, it is nice to get a little financial reward for it, but more than that, how do you do it in, in a way that enables you to keep up morale for everybody and, um, and to make the experience enjoyable enough or at least not terrible enough that you want to <laughs> continue doing it because you can run into situations. And I know we did in the past, like in the nineties, we, we would run into these situations where making records was, was kind of miserable, not just for me, but I mean, I saw other people who were, mm -hmm. who were clearly unhappy um, in the situations we were in. And, and there were many reasons for that, including some interpersonal reasons, but but a lot of the time, the reason was you were working, you know, we were working in situations that were not optimum because, you know, we didn't have the money to work the way we should have been working. So, you know, all this stuff kind of ties together. I mean, it's real easy for somebody who doesn't do it or for somebody who only does it as a hobby to say, oh, you should just do it. And it's like fun. It's like, yeah, that's fine if you're doing it as a hobby, but you're going in prepared to lose money and, and it's not. It's mm -hmm. not anything that needs to have longevity. Whereas when I'm doing it, I'm always thinking long term, and and I'm yeah, yeah. You cannot you cannot keep it an hobby for more than a few years, yeah, you, especially you if you're younger. Design. And it's the nineties. <laughs> I got to keep my musicians interested. I got to keep them focused and keep their morale up because um, it's a good group of guys. I really enjoy working with them. It's the it's probably the you know the only lineup I've ever had where, um, you know I really look forward to seeing those guys and working with them and playing shows with them and stuff like that. We all get along and and uh, um, and we play great together. I mean it's really the first incarnation of the band ever that feels to me like really a real band. I mean we came we we've come close to it here and there over the past ten years. But this, this group of guys kind of really gelled. And I want to keep that going. I want to keep that momentum going. So, you know, yeah, theoretically, I, you know, I've got the songs. So it's just a matter of, you know, if the money's there, I'd go make another record next year. But it, it depends on the money because I can't, you know, I have bills to pay too, you know. And, mm -hmm. and like a lot of musicians, this virus has, has wiped out my earning power. I can't go out and play gigs. So, um, you know, I got to... I really got to sit here going, okay, uh, priority one is make sure that, uh, you know, the bank doesn't take my house. <laughs> 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 yes. Well, about the band members, um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about them because, uh, probably in the, most of the people here in Europe, there are um, a lot of guys that follow your band are fans, but maybe a, a bit out of touch with um, they, they didn't see you many times live because you came to Europe a few times and also maybe they don't follow much of the American uh, I don't know uh, groups uh, Facebook groups uh, or conversation uh, they don't pay sure. much attention so the members of your band at the moment uh, they have been with you for quite a a long time maybe even yep. more than many of the past uh, iconic member of the band i can say because you had some some uh, l like uh, um, past members that are uh, linked to the, what is considered a golden age of pop punk and uh, a special moment for your band uh, the, the 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 90s and uh, look at records so uh, many uh, of us we still have in their hearts the, the the lineup of those years but those years were very quick and uh, yeah. actually, the lineup was slightly changing <laughs> time to time. Yeah. And uh, what I see now is still, uh, sometimes it's still to this time, I see comments like, uh, yeah, it's Ben Weezer with some random guys. But these guys are good musicians. They have, uh, have been in the scene for many, many years. And yeah. also, they are good guys that you could, have a, 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 you could meet at a show, drink a beer with, and have a lot of fun with. Uh, who are these guys? Uh, can, can you can you say well, a couple of things about them, about each one of them, and uh, yeah, and well, like speaking to someone who hasn't heard of them? 
Yeah, so Pierre uh, Marche joined, um, Pierre Marche and, and Mike Hunchback joined right after this whole thing happened at South by Southwest where I punched a couple ladies. I mean, between you and me, they were no ladies. But, uh, but uh, the, you know, everybody got all upset about that. The internet canceled me. And, uh, and so that, and that was a really, really good time because you knew anybody who stepped up and said, I want to join Screeching Weasel at that point, you knew they had big brass balls. I mean, you had to, to join at that because you were going to catch some sh shit. So Zach Damon, who had been in the band briefly in the late 90s, called me up and said, hey, man, you need somebody I'm in. And I'm like, I said, Zach, if you join up again, you're going to take a lot of shit. He's like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. If anybody gives me any shit, I'll tell them to go fuck themselves. I was like, all right, right on, you're in. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he understood. So, so he brought Pierre, uh, and Pierre had played in some bands with Zach, like uh, what was the band they played in together? Um, it was the one, it was kind of a power pop thing. And I, the name is just, I think it was called Miracle Drugs. And uh, I may be wrong about that, but Pierre had played with him. And so he came on. And as of now, Pierre has played drums in the band longer than any other drummer, like by, by kind of a lot. And uh, Mike Hunchback also came on board. You know, Mike sent me an email around that time. I didn't know him, but he sent me an email around that time. And he said, hey, listen, uh, I see a lot of the stuff that's going on here and it's just, it's bullshit. He said, I, 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 I think it's really obnoxious and offensive how people are, are piling on. Uh, and uh, if you ever need anything, let me know. So I, I said, okay, you know, you want to try out on, on uh, rhythm guitar, let's do it. And uh, boy, he showed up at that first show and he just, he had everything down cold. He didn't need rehearsal everything down cold. I mean, he was just ready to go. So those guys came on, Zach Damon, and then Dave Klein at the time was our bass player, uh, who was a friend of uh, Mike Kennedy, who's our producer. And, uh, and Klein has played in a bunch of bands as well. So, so those guys came on and then Klein went and joined Black Flag a couple of years later. So oh, yeah. So we got Poutine in, and Poutine's another guy who's friends with Damon and, and Pierre, and he was fucking awesome, man. He came in and played his first gig with us at a festival up in Quebec, and uh, and he just he fit right in right away. Plus, um, he's a uh, he's a good backing vocalist as well. You know, Klein can yell, but uh, <laughs> but Klein doesn't maybe have the sweetest, uh, most dulcet tones. <laughs> So we so we got him in, and then more recently, after Damon left, we got Trevor Jackson in. He had been um, mm -hmm. managing for us. So you, I think, when you met him, he was our tour manager. Yeah, yeah, I met him as a tour manager first. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then, but he was always a guitarist, and I was like, man, you know, the guy. We all got along really well, so it's like, you know, I was going to try out different guys. I talked to a couple guys, and finally, I was like, man. The, just like, let's keep it the way it is and not mess up the dynamic. Mm -hmm. So now he might, we might need to kind of replace him on a temp basis going forward because typically he's on the road with Billy Eilish. Yeah. But, but um, he had a lot to do. So all those guys, so Pierre was really interesting because um, when he started, I was like, this guy can probably swing it, but he's going to have to work hard because people don't realize when they join the band how hard it is to get up there and play 27 songs in about 65 mm. minutes. And, and they're not prepared. They don't have the stamina. They're not prepared for the pressure and all that. But he stepped up to the plate and I've seen him over the past 10 years. He's, he's just, he was good, but he's gotten so much better. And working with him on a recording is great because he's got a, you know, he's a songwriter. He's doing like a solo project now and stuff. Mm -hmm. So he has an understanding of songs, which is if you, if you can get a drummer who's really into songs and especially one who knows how to write songs, you're ahead of the game. If the guy's a good player and he understands songs, then you're going to be in a great position because he's always going to play to the song, which mm -hmm. is what air does. And uh, Poutine also, I mean, he's just locked in on the bass uh, Hunchback doing his thing, he's got kind of that surf guitar thing he does, that echoplex kind of sound. And then Trevor actually did a lot of the pre-production with me. In fact, he 
co-produced three of the tunes because three of them were recorded at a different studio like a year and a half ago. And uh, so Trevor was is also a writer and was really involved in the pre-production and in the production. And then you bring Mike, our producer in, and it all comes together. It was really fun. Mm -hmm. It was um, invigorating. And I think we all kind of felt like we had something to prove, which you're always, when you feel like you have something to prove, you're always going to make uh, a better record or put on a better show. <laughs> I am anyway. If I get, if everybody's telling me, ah, oh, you're great and blah, blah, blah. It's it's not as interesting to me, but when people are like, "You suck," you've been around too long, and <laughs> so from 1990, whatever was better on drums or whatever, I'm like, "Oh yeah, fuck you," because I'm gonna get up on stage and kick your fucking ass with this band. Yeah, and yeah. The way you're gonna be able to say what you've been saying is if you lie to yourself, motherfucker. So I, I take it as a great challenge, and you know we've got guys that get out there. They've got so much energy. They've got so much focus. Right? They're not. They're, they know the songs so well that they're no longer thinking about the songs. They're just thinking about fucking kicking ass on stage. And it is a powerful power. It's so much better than that. You know, I used to hate playing live. It's just so much better than those old lineups. Um, uh, you know, we had some good guys in the band back then. Don't get me wrong, but it was never, it never came together. There was never any moment where I was like, this is it. This is a lineup. Like, I know the fans will be like, oh, this lineup or that lineup, but it wasn't, dude. I was there. I was there, and it wasn't – it just never really came together. So it's nice to have that chance when you're older to get it right. And I think we got it right uh, this time. We got a lot of people telling us this is our best album since the early 90s, and, and I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good record. Uh some freaks of atavism, uh, uh, let's say you have it on digital distribution only at the moment, and uh, there's people asking how they can get your merchandise. Yeah, that's, uh, if you go like to our Facebook page, you can click shop now. There's a shop now button. If you don't have um, Facebook, you can go to our website, screechingweasel.com and click on store. Everything's always in stock. They print on demand. And there's a ton of designs up there. We got designs for the new album. We got, you can get the stuff, you know, on hoodies, on baby onesies, kid shirts, girl shirts, you name it. So we're in a good situation merch-wise. And, uh, you know, they ship overseas and stuff like that. So okay, uh, I, I would say your best bet, screechingweasel.com, click on store, and, uh, and you'll be all set up. All right. Uh, what about criticisms? You had uh, any... Any criticisms for the for the record that uh, maybe made you may got got to the spot or anything? Yeah, oh. you you seem you seem to be uh, always excited by the bad news <laughs> more than the good news. Yeah, there's it's like there's a, a, it's like hey, this album is great. Uh, and you say oh yeah, yeah, it's a good album. But if someone tells you hey, this, this thing sucks. You, you get you get uh, way more excited. So <laughs> I wanted to I wanted yeah, I mean, to know they, if you, you had something that was worth. And like I've seen a couple comments like this album sucks, but that but that's all they're saying. I mean I wonder. That's if not motivation. Yeah. Like they're saying it to say it. It's like if you're gonna if you're gonna knock it, man, get into it. You know, get into the meat of it and really come up with some some harsh criticisms. And I no, I haven't seen anything like that anyway. But listen, I mean, I think that stuff is um, inevitable and, and I think it's okay to, uh, I think it's okay to, for, if people feel the need to do that, I guess that's fine. <clears throat> I, I think as a, uh, I think if you're in a band, it's, it's you got to train yourself to, um, to just let that, uh, you know, just don't think about that too much. Let that roll off your back as it were, because it, because <laughs> it's, I mean, ultimately, those people aren't buying merch. They're not buying tickets to the shows. They're not paying the bills. The one thing you find out, Andrea, when you get canceled, just in case this ever happens to you, should you ever get canceled, make a note that um, you find out who your friends are and who they're not, and you find out who your fans are and who they're not. And, and I had, I'm so glad that happened because we came back within a few months with an entirely new lineup, and mm -hmm. we sold out the first show we played. We went out, we started selling out more shows. We were drawing more fans. We were making more money. We were selling more merchandise. I mean, it was it was great. The fans showed up, and they were like, dude, 
that was bullshit. We're screeching weasel pain. Nothing's going to keep us from coming. Yeah, I remember people. probably when you came back uh, as a, uh, with a with a new lineup and uh, you restarted, uh, probably you were more focused and also, yeah, you had, uh, you had a, a core of fans that you can count on and you started yeah. from that. And then, uh, well, people probably forget. Uh, I mean, uh, I remember in, in the 90s, uh, now records like major label debut or television city dream are now considered uh, like uh, uh, some of the highlights of your discography. But uh, I was already, because I'm old, I was already there in the 90s. I was already a Screeching with a fan and I was already in the punk rock scene. And I remember that uh, at the time, There was someone saying, you know, oh, what's happening to Kitchen Wizard? Why are they playing? Why are they having this kind of production? Uh, I don't like this album. And uh, now I hear people saying they never did uh, anything good after, I don't know, Team Punk's in it. Uh, yeah. and, and then I think, okay, but this, this is probably going to change in a bunch of years. <laughs> and people, and people is going <laughs> to say, oh, yeah, Baby Fat, you remember the great album? And uh, well, why is, it is probably your record that get more criticisms. Uh, in, uh, in your discography, I think. Yeah, when, we, when our second record came out, Boogada Boogada Boogada, came out in 1988, we had people who were just like, these guys suck now. Their first album was great. <laughs> Bullshit. I'm serious. And every I, single, I don't doubt it. Every single record after that, it's like, oh, these guys used to be great, now they suck. I think every band experiences that, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so after it happens over and over and over again, you learn to just go... Some people are going to complain no matter what. And mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, you know, typically when I like a band, um, it takes a lot for me to stop following them and paying attention to what they're doing. But I always liked, I always think it's funny, and this still happens all the time to this day. You'll get these people who are like, you know, they're pissed at you and, and they'll show up in the live stream or whatever and they'll say, uh, You fucking guys haven't made a good record since fucking Anthem for a New Tomorrow in 1993. And I'm going, do the math on that one. Because that's, uh, uh, that's like 27 years ago. Am I right on the math on that? 27 yeah. years ago? 1993. And I go, what? why did you keep listening? Like at some point, <laughs> why the fuck would you keep listening? If, if we just put out shitty record after shitty record, at some point you guys say, I'm just going to stop listening to the record. I mean, why are you torturing yourself? You're a masochist. Well, the, I mean, it's because they're full of shit. But, uh, but it's just, it's weird to me. You know, if a band gets that bad, stop listening. Don't torture yourself, please. Even, um, even for my sake, don't. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, about, about the... Um, hmm, I have another question that is uh, for you, which is... Uh, Cinema, cinema. Uh, my best player told me that uh, you're writing, uh, like uh, sometimes you, you take the time to write uh, scripts. Yeah. And also, everybody knows that you did uh, when you were, were a kid, like a, a movie, uh, which was a big effort for being an, an, an amateurish uh, uh, movie, which is. Uh, uh, has been uh, going around on VHS <laughs> since the 90s. Yeah. And uh, so, so, somebody digitalized it recently. So uh, I stumbled across it. And uh, so are you passionate about the movies? Uh, are you maybe thinking that uh, you still had this thing in your mind when you, when you wanted to accomplish something in that area, Phil? No, I mean, there's really no connection there because... Um, I'm not particularly passionate about movies. I mean, I like good movies like anybody, but uh, I'm, I'm more passionate about storytelling. And it's really a matter mm -hmm. of, you know, what are the, you know, what are the most efficient ways when you can't make records because you don't have the money and you've still got a creative urge, what, what is the best way to uh, indulge that creative urge uh, without going bankrupt? And, and one of the best way to do that is writing because it doesn't cost anything. And so it, all it costs is time, and I'm willing to put the time into it. So uh, I started out a few years ago, and I, didn't, I had no idea what I was doing, and it was terrible. 
and I had to write a lot of bad stuff. And now it's starting to get a little bit better, mainly because I've had uh, the good fortune of having friends who are who are in the film uh, business who um, have been able to give me pointers and, and help me out. And so, uh, you know, the, the, there's always the question of, well, what, you know, how is this going to manifest in, for fans? And, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think actually getting a script produced and on the screen is, um, is above my pay grade. I mean, that, that's, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that business is very, very, very difficult, much more difficult than music. But, um, but you see, the smart move, Andreo, probably would have been to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write novels because I could self-publish those. But I, I'm just not very interested in the novel form. I'm interested in, mm -hmm. in dialogue. So I'm focusing on, on screenplays and, and stage plays. And really, at this point, I'm just trying to get better at it. Um, and... Uh, and but it's it's enjoyable, and I think if you look at if you look at my songs, you know, going back to the early '90s, there's been a, a slow, uh, uneven but slow progression toward towards moving towards more of a story-based uh, type of songwriting. Um, yeah. So this is, I think, a natural extension of that. Realizing that you know, there's a point. I think everybody starts out and everything's pretty personal. Um, exactly. That, kind of that's what I was thinking. That and when when you write your first songs, so you write the other things you know and your own experience, that's and you right. write like a, it's like an extension of your diary when you were a, a mm -hmm. kid, all the letters you were sending to friends, and then yeah. suddenly you realize that if you if you can open up uh, uh, and and, uh, and maybe you know even invent stories and. Uh, uh, create situations and uh, maybe put a little bit of poetry into it and uh, it all changes and, uh, and you, you can say you've grown up as a songwriter maybe. Yeah, but you guys have done that too on some of your records where you've gone in yeah. for more like kind of conceptual pieces, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so and, and, and I mean I've seen that in your songwriting and I've seen that in a lot of songwriters that I admire where you begin to realize that you can you actually have more possibilities and you can put your point across more effectively and get to the truth of a thing more easily when you pursue it through fiction, which is the whole reason that, that fiction started in the first place uh, <laughs> years ago. And, and Aristotle uh, uh, came up with his, his uh, rules about it and so forth. Was it Aristotle or Socrates? I can't remember, but um, they had, they had all their rule, you know, all these rules, which still apply to storytelling now. So it's just another way of doing of doing the same thing of kind of trying to get to um, get to a truth uh, in the most effective way possible. Another fun thing is that when uh, in the case now that that uh, the songwriting has gone uh, up to storytelling in the case that you put some personal and uh, fact or or feeling into a song. Uh, you do it uh, right uh, on the spot and uh, with a more um, uh, more consciousness, and uh, yeah. it's, it's even more rewarding than it was in the past when you were a kid and you you fell in love. You write a love song and uh, that's it. And then another week uh, you fell in love with somebody else and write another love song. Or at least right. that was happen was happening to me at the time. And uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you have your you, you you know the key is always how do you retain the passion of that and the immediacy and urgency of that how do you retain that when you're older and still take a more controlled deliberate uh uh objective approach to it and trying to figure out how to strike that balance can be very difficult but for me a lot of it has has come down to finding the right producer and to finding the right musicians because they can help carry quite a lot of that when you get, um, frankly, when you get new guys in, when you get new blood in, there is a surge of energy. And I think that's also, you know, maybe part of the reason why we went through a lot of band members. I mean, there were a lot of factors there. But, uh, but I know that if those times where you would get somebody in who maybe had a little bit different of a take on something, um, there were times when I could use that to my advantage um, and, and kind of get a little bit of a burst of energy because they're not burnt out. You know, a lot of guys do this and it's like, hey, it's punk rock. None of us are getting rich off of it. 
And you do it long enough, you can get burnt out. God knows I do, okay? And what helps quite a lot for me is having these guys who have the level of energy. You know, I found what really helped for me was having guys who have solid day jobs. They're, they're not going to quit their job. They're not trying to be rock stars. This is just something that they do uh, on the side. And so then they have an attitude towards it and an energy about it that can be hard to get. Um, from somebody who's a who's um, a working musician, you know, who relies on it for a living. That's not always true, but I found that to be the case a lot of the time for me. I see. Okay, uh, Ben, just a couple yeah. of things. Uh, are the, the questions that I'm not asking, because I know you've been asked those questions uh, a lot of times, but I want to give a, a quick answer anyway to uh, people that, that I see are. <laughs> already commenting uh okay the album is out on digital uh yeah. it's beautiful it's got a nice uh, cover art by riccardo bucchioni and uh, it's that uh, clockwork orange uh, um, rip off with the uh, with the weasel logo and uh, the album title is some freaks of advis but uh, it's not supposed to be out on physical formats like CD and vinyl at the moment. And this is something that you will be replying to, well, to many of these questions. It's just people, it, it's, it's a little annoying to me because it seems like people care more about the format than the music on the format, which I don't understand. But it will be eventually on vinyl. But right mm -hmm. now, you know, there's two, there were two factories in the world that were processing, um, creating lacquers for cutting vinyl masters, one of them burnt down. Yeah, that one, one burnt down, I guess. Yeah, so you've got one left and they cannot keep up with demand. So that's problem number one. And problem number two is we moved the release up by five months, so we had no chance to plan for vinyl. So mm -hmm. eventually, yes, we plan on doing it, but it just, it can't happen right now. And uh, oh. as far as CDs, I mean, that is just such a waste of time and money. I mean, no, no, so few people buy them, it's not worth it. For yeah, us. yeah. But you can still print a few hundreds, but still. Uh, not cool. Anyway, this is one, this is the first question I was not going to ask. <laughs> and another, another, another question I'm not going to ask is, are you playing Raduno? Are you playing Italy? Are you playing shows in Europe? Uh, well, the situation for this year is, it is what it is. And yeah. about the Raduno Festival, I can say that uh, you are, uh, of course, the most requested musician uh, at the festival since we started. And every year, I can, I can say to, to our friends here now, that every year I start booking the festival with an email, to, with an offer to you to come to play some, and that you, you politely uh, decline. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, sometimes it's the timing, sometimes it's the budget, uh, but uh, it, it is a tradition. Every year I ask uh, <laughs> Scritch and Lisa then, if they can come play the Raduno. Uh, every if, year uh, we say, ever, that, well, maybe next year. If you ever stop asking me, my feelings will be hurt, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, of course, I'm not going to stop. Yeah. But if you say yes, I will be very scared. Because something, yeah, something might be wrong. <laughs> I, I, I don't think the answer is going to please anybody over there. Because for a lot of people, especially for these pop punk bands, they'll go anywhere and do anything if they can, like, break even doing it. And I don't do business that way, number one. And, and what does that have to do with that? Well, Europe, the money just isn't very good in Europe compared to the U.S. So... Um, so it's hard to, uh, and plus the expenses obviously are much higher. Things are much more expensive in, in, you know, everything, food, hotel, gas, rentals, you name it, they're all much more expensive. So, um, but at the same time, you still got to pay your same rate to the people who work for you and, uh, and you still got to pay your per diems and so forth. So, um, so it's hard logistically to work that out. co-headline in London with uh, uh, MXPX a few years MXPX. ago. I mean, the opportunities do arise sometimes, but it's really, it's difficult uh, sometimes for us to get over there because we're not, you know, like some of these guys you get over there, it's just like, I know, I know how they do business because some of them I know personally, some of them used to be in my band and it's like, they're going to go, they're going to go over there and work for basically, 
you know, they come home with nothing. And I can't do that. I'm not in a position to do that. I've got bills to pay. So if I'm going to go out and do gigs, I got to, I got to turn a profit. So I think that's, and I know fans don't want to hear that, but this is my job, you know? Well, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, you, you didn't really owe us uh, an explanation, but uh, thank you anyway for, 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 for this. Uh, you know, the festival is going uh, pretty well. It is a gathering of fans. Every year we, we get a chance to see each other. You know, people in bands that uh, maybe we met 20 years ago somewhere in the middle of nowhere playing a show together in Belgium or or the Netherlands, or Germany somewhere. And uh, it's all people that has been in touch for many years, and now every summer we get the chance to uh, see each other. You know, some of, those, uh, some of them are coming with their families and kids. Uh, it's changing, but it's still driven by the same uh, passion, I think. So and, I think... Uh, and that's, I think that's fine, and you know what? I think someday we're going to be able to make it happen, I'm sure. But... Um, obviously nothing's going to happen this year, but you know, it's not, if we can work it out where we can work out some other things and get over, do like three, four dates, um, you know, maybe leave that as an Italy ex exclusive. Yeah, I believe you. The, the best thing is to do a, a tour around it, which is yeah. what we say to any band from, uh, from the States that write us and say, okay, can I play your festival? I say, okay, but yes, but we can, we cannot pay, pay you for the value of flying, uh, from the United States to come one show in the afternoon uh, at a festival. If you set up a tour around it uh, and you, 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 you can have a spot at a festival and it's going to be a good chance for you to be in, in, in an event that already has its, uh, its following. Uh, right. Okay. Well, Ben, Just thank stop. you for your time. I, um, oh, okay. I think I'm um, probably wrapping it up here, but I wanted to ask you uh, maybe a, a, a last question which is uh, just uh, anything you want to say to European fans and uh, in this particular moment or in general, now that you have the chance probably to have uh, uh, people listening from uh, all over Europe that maybe hasn't been in touch with you lately. Well, and first, also, first, I wanted, I wanted to remind you, your new album is out, uh, uh, Some yeah. Freaks of Atavism on Digital Distribution. Yes. Some Freaks of Atavism, iTunes, Amazon, uh, uh, Spotify, fucking all those things. I don't know anything about all those things. Um, but the, j just, just so you know, I want to say this before I – and I will answer your question. But I love you, and we will, we will do our best to get over there at some point, some way, or somehow. But in terms of the fans over there in Europe, I mean, you guys – You know, especially in Italy, you guys are ahead of us on this uh, coronavirus thing, and it's, it's been bad, although from what I understand, the past couple of days, those numbers are improving. Um, you know, we've got, a, we've got um, a tough road ahead of us, I think, here in the U.S., and, and how bad it gets, I don't know. But, but we certainly there are lots of us who are listening to the doctors and the scientists and the expert, experts and who are paying attention to what's happening, especially in Italy, and who realize this is a really tragic situation because it's not just overloaded hospitals and, um, and having to make these horrible ethical decisions about who gets a ventilator and who doesn't, or even who gets Yeah, it happens somewhere. I mean, this is a, this is a ter that's a terrible choice to have to make. But on top of that, a lot of people are losing their jobs. They're losing their businesses. And, and you know, we have that over here as well our guitarist mike hunchback you know his his record shop is shut down and they're in the best of times they're on a razor thin profit margin so i'd say you know for those of you in europe who can support um people and, and people in lots of industries are suffering but if you can support uh, musicians that you like uh and buy a t-shirt or stream their music which is the easiest thing and costs you basically nothing yeah. um, that can help a lot of us to get by in these tough times. I'm doing okay, thank God. But a lot of people could really use that help and uh, it can make a big difference. You know, ultimately we're all gonna get through this. And I think, you know, when, when something like this happens, you've got to say, well, is there anything positive, you know, that can come out of this? And I think the thing to come out of this is what you were talking about at the beginning, if I recall correctly, or maybe it was a private conversation you and I had earlier today, I don't remember, but this idea, I think at the beginning of this live stream, you yeah. talked about the power of art, the power of 
uh, the, the, the creative world in the face of something like this. It's not just some um, esoteric thing that doesn't have to do with our situation. Art has everything to do with our situation right now. It is extremely powerful. It's extremely important. And uh, I think if you're stuck and you're quarantined and you can't do anything, there's never been a better time than to read. Read these great uh, uh, novels that are out there. Watch great films. Watch great uh, uh, productions of, of operas and, and symphonies and uh, plays. And listen to music, stream music. I mean, that we create this stuff for this, for these tough times, for the human condition. You know, you, Andre, I'm sure you've experienced this too, where you will have people come up to you and say, literally, I was going to kill myself. And I listened to your record and it gave me hope. Okay. So this is, this can be life or death stuff. It really does matter. It, it, art is meant to reflect the human condition. And especially not just in times of joy, but in times of sorrow as well. Let's turn to art. It has value. There are people who say it doesn't. And there are people who say it doesn't really matter and it's not real. But I think we know that it is real, that it's in, yeah. in a way more real than the reality we deal with every day. That doesn't mean stick your head in the sand. It doesn't mean don't take precautions. It doesn't mean don't take this virus seriously. We have to do that. But by God, we're smart and we're capable and we can juggle those balls and recognize that art matters. Creativity matters. And it's there. It's there specifically to speak to you during these difficult times. So take advantage of it. Yeah, sometimes also in these days I've been thinking, uh, well, maybe a new uh, renaissance. Or what's, what's the, I, I don't know if, uh, if I spelled it right, but may, maybe a new renaissance was going to come out of this mess. I hope so. Uh, yeah, let's just hope it and do our best. God knows I've got time to write songs. <laughs> of course <laughs> okay Ben well I think uh, I think I can just well thank you thank you for being with us and uh, good luck with your new album but I think you don't need much luck because the album is good and it's going well <laughs> thank you very much okay thank you Ben together so long take care ciao bye bye, bye, -bye.